Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The death toll is rising as massive amounts of rain from Hurricane Harvey continue to flood Houston and other parts of Texas and Louisiana. The Houston police and Coast Guard have rescued over 6,000 people from their homes, but many remain stranded. Meteorologists forecast another foot of rain could fall on the region in the coming days. Harvey, which is now a tropical storm, is heading back to the Gulf of Mexico and is expected to make landfall again on Wednesday. So much rain has already fallen that the National Weather Service has had to add two new colors to its maps to indicate rainfall levels. Parts of Texas are expected to top 50 inches of rain, and the rivers keep rising. Southwest of Houston and Richmond, the Brazos River reached flood stage overnight at 45 feet, and the National Weather Service forecasts it'll peak at 59 feet on Friday and remain over 50 feet through Sunday. Houston's KHOU described the epic amount of rainfall. I want to show you what a meteorologist has done. There it is. The meteorologist calculates by the end of Wednesday, Harvey will have saturated all of southeast Texas with enough water to fill all the NFL and college stadiums, all those stadiums, more than a hundred times. Think about that. More than a hundred times. So, so far, the meteorologist is saying 15 trillion gallons of rain mm. has fallen on a large area and another five trillion or six trillion gallons forecast by the end of Wednesday. The official death toll is 14, but authorities warn it could rise dramatically once the floodwaters recede. Six people from one family died after their van was swept away by floodwaters. Emergency shelters are approaching capacity. Crowded, but all they said that we're getting 800 more people. And it's like, what? Where are they going to put us all? You know, what about us from Corpus? What are we going to do? And FEMA's here right now, but the line is enormous. Yesterday, we were in line for three hours and couldn't even see FEMA, so I don't know what's going to happen. Buses just keep rolling in, and we need everybody's help. Concern is also growing over the environmental impact of the storm. The Houston area is home to more than a dozen oil refineries. The group Air Alliance Houston is warning the shutdown of the petrochemical plants will send more than one million pounds of harmful pollution into the air. Residents of Houston's industrial communities are already reporting unbearable chemical-like smells coming from the many plants nearby. According to Brian Paris, an activist at the environmental justice group Tejas, Quote, fence line communities can't leave or evacuate, so they are literally getting gassed by these chemicals. The communities closest to these sites in Houston are disproportionately low income and minority. Meanwhile, on Saturday, a massive fuel storage tank at Kinder Morgan's Pasadena terminal began spilling after being toppled in the storm. The tank held 6.3 million gallons of gasoline, but it's unclear how much of that leaked. And in the city of Laporte, residents were asked to take uh, go to the nearest shelter, close doors and windows after a chemical spill was reported last night. While the National Hurricane Center is now calling Harvey the biggest rainstorm on record, it's not come as a complete surprise. Scientists have been predicting for years climate change could result in massive storms like Harvey. Climate scientist Michael Mann wrote this. Quote, Harvey was almost certainly more intense than it would have been in the absence of human-caused warming, which means stronger winds, more wind damage, and a larger storm surge. We go now to Houston to speak with Robert Bullard, known as the father of environmental justice, currently a distinguished professor at Texas Southern University. He's the former director of the Environmental Justice Resource Center at Clark Atlanta University. We're reaching Dr. Bullard from his home in Houston, which he needs to evacuate later this morning due to the rising Brazos River. Professor Bullard, thanks so much for being with us. Can you talk about the situation you're in and so many people in Houston are in right now? Describe the scene for us and then how you relate it to your life's work, to the issue of climate change and environmental justice. Well, good morning and thanks for having me. Uh, Harvey and the aftermath, the flooding of Houston and the surrounding areas, 
Uh, it's of biblical proportion. This is a nightmare. And the the images that you see on television and you hear the you, you hear the voices of of people who have been just totally um, destroyed. And this is um, this is a situation where I think it's it's um, it's telling us that we have to change. Uh, we have to change the way we do business and the way that we, uh, as humans, interact with our environment. And this is uh, basically um, uh, the situation where this storm, this flooding of this city, uh, tells us that, that there's no place that's immune from, from devastation. Uh, I worked, you know, in New Orleans and the flooding after Katrina. You know, New Orleans was only 500,000 people. Houston is 2.3 million people. And then you look at the surrounding areas, you're talking 5.5 or almost 6 million people. And so you talk about this devastation, it is of historic proportion. And, and Dr. Bullard, uh, to what degree do you think uh, uh, unchecked development by uh, Houston's uh, officials over the se past several decades has uh, created an even uh, worse possibility for calamity when a natural disaster like this hits? Well, Houston, it was it is actually uh, uh, was a catastrophe catastrophe waiting to happen. Uh, given the fact you have unrestrained capitalism, no zoning, uh, laissez-faire uh, re regulations when it comes to control of the very um, uh, industries that have created lots of problems when it comes to um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases and and other industrial pollution. Uh, the impact uh, that basically has been ignored uh, for many years. And so the, the fact that uh, this is, you know, it is a disaster, uh, but it's a very predictable disaster. And those communities that, that historically have borne the burden of environmental pollution and contamination uh, from these many uh, industries um, at, at the same time are the very communities that are bearing disproportionately the burden of, of this flooding. And so you, you get this pre-existing condition of inequality uh, before the storm and this inequality in terms of, of how people are able to address uh, this disaster uh, because of vulnerability. And I think, I think what we have to do is look at some lessons we'll not learn from Katrina in terms of the rebuilding, redevelopment, and, and, um, and, and, and recovery. And uh, there's been quite a bit of second-guessing of Mayor Sylvester Turner's decision not to call for a, an evacuation of the city. I'm wondering your take on that, especially given what happened with Hurricane—was uh, it Rita a few a couple of years ago, when there was an evacuation uh, uh, effort made, but more people ended up dying, about 100 people in the gridlock that occurred as people tried to leave a city as large as Houston's? Well, it's easy to second-guess, but if the fact is that— that trying to evacuate, you know, 2.3 uh, million people uh, in, on these highways is, is almost a task that's uh, impossible. And so, the, the I, I, you know, I, I don't think, you know, there was uh, uh, anything that you can say, well, why, why is it that the mayor and, and the county judge decided to go this way? Uh, you know, when you look at the, you know, the, the problems of, of logistics and trying to, you know, move this many people you know, on these highways, getting out of the city, that that uh, probably was not, uh, you know, uh, a good uh, a good choice to make. And so I think the decision to have people shelter in place, uh, and uh, and no one could predict, you know, the 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 what happened afterwards. And so I, I think the the best that we can do now, uh, instead of pointing fingers, is pointing to solutions and pointing to way that we can uh, address the many uh, problems and challenges that we face today. And having, you know, having to uh, evacuate and leave your home and, 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 be, and go out there and, and not know what, uh, what's ahead of you, I mean, you, you have your life, and, and, and I'm blessed. Um, uh, and that when you see those, those images, you can see that this is pain. And I think— uh, all government officials and governmental agencies and voluntary associations and, and civic groups and, and faith groups, we have to come together and, and, 
make sure that uh, we do what's right and not, not what's politically expedient, but do what's right uh, and make sure that we build, you know, a just and healthy and sustainable uh, city when we rebuild and Do when we recover. It Do has to be.